What's up, Pika, Plammer, Quaron, and Amin? Hey, glad to have you back, Quaron. <laughs> nice, Ando Bear. Hello, Kate. This is called a banjo, I mean. Hello, Nookus. Hello, Mike. It's a little bit out of tune, but banjos are supposed to be out of tune. something like that. <laughs> okay. I want to learn how to play some Mumford and Sons. Because they shred on the banjo. Not quite at that level yet. How are you guys doing today? Are you ready to learn more about estimators? Ando, you had an interview this morning. Hey, what's up, Brandon? Ooh, Carl's ready to eliminate part three of the homework. Good morning, D. Stratus. How was your interview, Ando Bear? Okay, so I have this handout and um, the first part of the handout is trying to organize some things we've done over the past two weeks. And I'm trying, because I know it was like spread out and now I'm trying to condense it into one place. So you can come back to this handout and get a good summary. Antonio, you've been doing an ant, column, ant colony optimization for MAE552, that sounds really interesting do you have like a an animation or something that's right it's a handout day 
Okay, so let's go through this. We have a lot of math to do today. Okay, so here we go. We have this cart pendulum. We want to balance it. Um, we have a motor that spins over here and it pulls the belt and then it moves it back and forth so we can balance it. So what you can do is you can use physics to get this second order differential equation for the pendulum angle as a function of the acceleration of the base. So that's what we did. We spent, we spent some time building that and then we converted it to a continuous time state space model. State space model. And so this is our, Y is our output. We're measuring the angle of the pendulum and our input is this motor angular velocity. That's our input. And it's related to the acceleration of the cart through this like gear ratio. All right. And then we defined two states, X1 and X2. State definitions. And once you do this, We converted state equations to matrix form. And this is a continuous time state space model in matrix form. So we have our continuous time A matrix, B matrix, C, and D. but we're doing digital controls in discrete time. So once you have that continuous model, you use these equations in this block to convert to discrete time. So like the first thing, what's your sampling frequency gonna be? For us, it's 20 Hertz. And from there you get your sampling period. And then these are the equations for A, B, and C, D. Why is D always zero? It's not, it's not always zero. It's not always zero, I mean. But it, okay, I'll say it this way. It's non-zero if the output is proportional to the input in some way. Like in this output equation, if I was, if my output was the angular acceleration, actually the input is not acceleration in this case, but usually for, for mechanical models, if your output is related to acceleration, then D will be non-zero. But you're right, you're right. Uh, very often it's zero, but it's not always. All right, so if you use these equations to convert our continuous state space model to discrete time, I'm just writing out what um, each of those matrices are. So everything is the same size. A is still a two by two, B is still a two by one. C and D remain the same. Same as the continuous model. So this kind of just summarizes the journey from a free body diagram all the way to a discrete time state space model that we use for state feedback control. Now, when you design a state feedback controller, first thing you do, anytime you're designing a controller, you pick some target closed loop poles, and these are based on your performance specifications. 
So like to pick these ones, I said the settling time should be one second and the overshoot should be like 20%. And given the sampling frequency, that's how we got this. And then you can figure out what the characteristic equation is. So this polynomial has these Z star roots. Um, then, actually this, this block, I should have mentioned this earlier, but when we do state feedback, our control input depends on our states. And really I put a, a hat on top of these states because I mentioned last time, and we're gonna talk about this today, you never know the true states. So the best you can do is estimate the states. So I'll, I'll just put that here for now. Um, but we have this K parameter, that's the feedback gain matrix. That's what we're gonna multiply our states by. You have to solve for this matrix so that your closed loop poles are equal to the poles that you wanted, Z star. So now let's go back over here. If I know that I want this to be my characteristic equation for the closed loop system, this is how you solve for your gain matrix. And this is called the Ackermann formula. So for this specific problem, this is the Ackermann formula written out, or typically we're just gonna go to MATLAB and we're gonna use the Ocker command in this way. You give A, you give B, and then you list your target poles. Z star in like a vector form. And then, boom. So for our system, this is what our gain matrix turned out to be. So let's say we're running our controller on an Arduino. At every step, my control input, which in this case, it is the angular velocity of the motor that's pulling the belt. The angular velocity is gonna be 289 times my first state plus 102 times my second state, and then I take the negative sign of that. For homework five, do we have to do it by hand or is MATLAB fine? MATLAB is fine. Now that you know the secrets, but I mean, if you wanna be really cool, you could verify it by hand and improve your knowledge but you don't have to feel guilty about using MATLAB. Okay, um, let, me, let me say this. Okay, so here's our dilemma. My control input depends on, you did both to be cool, very nice, Carl. How do I, how do I get these states? So let's talk about that down here. Actually, this is a little typo. U is not, our control input is not the angular acceleration of the base, but um, it's related to it. So when is the second project going to be assigned? Very soon, very soon. It is imminent, Antonio, it is imminent. So we are measuring the the angle here now our second state which if you come all the way back up here this is the definition of our second state it's a little bit weird but it depends on the angular velocity which we're not measuring and um it also depends on our control input, which is the angular velocity of the motor. So it kind of depends on two measured, 
quantities. And for this example, we don't have this. So we talked about this a little bit last time. You could try to estimate what the angular velocity of the pendulum is. And um, there's a couple ways you could do that. One way that I suggested, which is not, it's not the best way. You could use your dynamic model, because we, we have we have a state space model. We used Newton's laws to get this model. You could take an initial guess at the initial states and maybe you can get a good initial guess, right? And then you can recursively use this model and keep updating the state. But um, there's some problems with this. There's at least two problems. To do this, you need a good initial state estimate. which sometimes you can't get. The stream is too high quality to watch? What do you mean? Did something happen? Are you guys having problems? Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is that the model even if it's, a, if it's a very good model, it isn't entirely accurate. Oh no. I hope your internet comes back to full functionality, Weiss. Okay, and then a third problem is this model doesn't account for for random disturbances. Like what if your cat walks by and hits the pendulum and tries to knock it over? This model doesn't account for cats. So if that ever happened, your state estimate would be totally off. I mean, it's always the cats. Very real. I, I know for Pika, this is a realistic problem. Okay, so I introduced um, the prediction state estimator, also known as the Lundberger observer. So we're going to spend the rest of today talking about how super cool this estimator is so what's an estimator it is an equation that predicts or or it estimates what your states are so this equation that i'm writing is an estimator just like if somebody asks you what's a controller a controller is fundamentally an equation that decides what your control input should be given some error. Got to hand it to your notes sheet here. Three problems is at least two problems. Wait, what does that mean? Oh, I see. <laughs> I see at least two problems. Uh, okay. Yeah, I put because I mean there could there could be even there could be even more than 3. Okay. <laughs> okay. I got to fix that hat. Okay. So, so 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 this Let's just point this out again. This is estimated output. This is your measured output. Qualifying statements are cool and good. Three greater than equal to two, the math, in fact, checks out in this case. So the difference between the estimated output and the measured output is the measurement prediction error.
With estimators, you're playing a guessing game. You're like, this is what I th think my output should be. But if it's a little bit off, you have some error. And then you try to update it so that you're always getting closer. Okay, and then this L is the estimator gain matrix. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to expand out some terms in this equation. So we need a couple definitions here. So the estimated output is, we use our output equation. So we have the C matrix times our states, but we're gonna use our estimated states. And that's what makes this a um, estimated output. Kate says, will we only be doing single input, single output systems? I noticed that only X is a vector. Kate, for now, for now, yes. However, I plan on doing a multi-output system, but not multiple input. I don't think we're gonna have time to get to multiple input. Okay, so the estimated output is C times your estimated states plus D, which is often zero, but let's put it in here. D times our inputs. Now, let's also remember this. Because we're using state feedback, our control input is going to be minus our gain matrix times our estimated states. So what I want to do is everywhere we see an output estimate, we're going to substitute in this expression. And everywhere we see our control input, we're going to substitute in what we know our control input to be. So let's, let's grind through that. Okay, and the reason we're doing this I want to prove to you that this equation for an estimator, it makes it so that your estimated states eventually converge to the true states. If you just tried to estimate your states using this equation, you would diverge. You would get farther and farther away from the true states. But the case is not the same for this, but I want to prove that to you. Okay. So it's, it's an interesting thing. So I'm going to first, so I'm, I'm working on this equation up here. So I know that this is gonna be minus B times K X K minus one. And then we have this L part and we're gonna put in our estimated output Y hat. So that's going to be C times X hat at K minus one plus D times U, but U is equal to minus K times X. So I'm going to make that substitution right here. So now I'm going to have D times K X K minus one and then minus Y K minus one. All right, and now notice, notice this equation depends a lot on the estimated states. They keep popping up over and over again. So let's gather those terms. It's going to be A minus BK minus LC plus LDK times my estimated states plus L times Y K minus one. You didn't know you're going to be doing so much linear algebra today. Well, you are. Okay. So we just rearranged this state estimate equation, substituting in terms 
that we know. So we, I guess we simplified the equation a little bit, even if it doesn't really look like it. Okay, now I want to introduce what is the state estimation error? So if you take our estimated states, xk, and then you subtract the true states, which we never know the true states in real life, by the way. So you just have to live with that. So we have this error. I'm going to make a new variable x tilde. And so this is just the state estimation error. It's the difference between your estimated state and the true state. And you might be asking, well, how could I ever know what this error is? Because you told me I never know what the true state is. So how can I take the difference between a variable and something I don't know? That's a good question. <laughs> so really, well, okay, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. So let's, let's calculate this difference. Let's write this out. Okay, so, okay, we know what this estimate is. Let's substitute this in here. So A minus BK minus LC plus LDK XK minus one. plus L Y K minus one. So that's the, that's the X hat. We just figured it out up above. And now we have to subtract the state, which we don't know, but we do, we do know something else. I know that I don't know the state, but I have a pretty good idea of what the model is, right? I know that the state at this time depends on the previous state and the input. And even this isn't perfect. The model isn't perfect, but it's pretty good. We used Newton's laws, and so I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on the model. So instead of plugging in the states, I'm going to plug in... Uh, this model, I mean, which does depend on the states of the previous step, which I don't know, but stay with me. Okay, so we have the state estimation error is equal to this, the difference between the estimated state and the true state. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to make some substitutions like we did up above. So let's start with Y. This is our measurement at the previous time step. So this is equal to C times our states plus D times our input at the previous time step. So I, once again, I'm just gonna substitute a bunch of stuff into this equation and get it in terms of estimated states wherever I can. So like U depends on the estimated states. So I'm gonna have minus D K, the estimated states at K minus one. All right, so we're gonna end up subbing this in for y. Okay, here, this is gonna be minus k times xk minus one. Because that we're defining what the control input is and we decide that it's always gonna be that. Okay. Now watch, watch what happens here, because it turns out a bunch of things are gonna cancel out. So like, let's expand this. This is gonna be plus L CXK minus one minus DK XK minus one.
And so you see over here we have a why do you have a line under all of your X? Oh, the line. No, no, no. The line means that it's a vector. So like, at least in this example, the states are a two by one column vector. Yes, so this is a, this line means it's a vector and this line means, or this hat means that it's estimated. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, over here I have plus LDK times X hat K minus one. But here I have minus LDK times X K minus one. So this is going to cancel with this. Okay, and then over here I have minus B times K X hat K minus one. Or wait, I have a minus here and I have a minus out in front. So this is going to be plus BK XK minus one. And over here I have minus BK times XK minus one. So it turns out this is going to cancel with this thing over here. So I know this is getting a little messy, but let's, let's rewrite this. So this isn't going to end up being only a minus LC times X hat K minus one. And then the only thing left over from this LY is gonna be plus LC X K minus one. And then the only thing from over here left over is minus A times X K minus one. And this is gonna turn into something a lot simpler in just a second. So you can see that this is a minus LC times X hat K minus one minus A minus LC times my states X K minus one. So we can gather some terms A minus LC times the difference between the estimated states and the true states at X K minus one and notice what is this? This is just the state estimation error at the previous time step. So I'm gonna put that little tilde, which means the error, the error. Okay, so let's write out, let's write out the final result. So, the state estimation error at the kth time step. We just went through the math. It's equal to the difference between those two. It turns out that that's equal to A minus LC times the state estimation error at the previous time step. This equation what are we looking at here? So number one, like this is a homogeneous state space model. So there's no like input term. It's just, I have my error at this step. It's related to the error at a previous step. So it's a homogeneous state space model that describes the dynamics of the state estimation error. I say the dynamics because it tells you how the state estimation error changes from step to step. So we obviously want error to go to zero. We want our estimated states to approach our true states because our control input depends on the states. And so we want to provide the best estimate of the states that we can. Um, how do you know if this equation is stable, unstable, if it goes to zero, 
etc. Based on your expert knowledge now in discrete linear system dynamics, how do I know if the if these dynamics go to zero, if they're stable, whatever? Whether A minus LC is above or below or equal to one. Oh, but what part of A minus LC? I think you're you're definitely on the right track here. If Yes, determinant eigenvalues. So if eigenvalues of A minus LC, remember this is a discrete time system. If the eigenvalues of A minus LC are inside the unit circle, in other words, if the eigenvalues are stable, um, the state estimation error, this vector goes to zero. And that means our estimated states will approach our true states even if we never know what the true states are, which blows my mind. This is kind of like a weird path to take. And, and it's something about estimation that I find totally fascinating that when we measure something out in the real world, the best thing we can do is use the sensor, but the sensors that we use are corrupted by noise or other problems. And we never really measure the real thing. We also have models that describe how real life things move, but those models are imperfect. And so we have sensors and we have models and we try to make sense of both of them. Um, and that's kind of estimation. And so th this equation, if I was trying to just conceptually explain it to somebody, it takes our model and it takes our sensor measurements and it tries to put them together to make the best sense of it. And this equation, the end result is that if I can make the eigenvalues of this thing inside the unit circle, then my estimated states should go to whatever those true states might be. And we're living inside the matrix. So how do we make the eigenvalues of A minus LC be stable? We have, to, we have to pick L. We decide what L has to be, but our goal is to make the eigenvalue stable. It's the same kind of problem when we pick the control gain, K. So that's what we're gonna do next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. When we calculated the control gain matrix, we used the Cayley Hamilton theorem, which led to the Ackermann formula. And now we can just use the Ackermann formula to solve for the control gain. So let's talk about the estimator gain. It's a very similar problem. You're trying to choose a matrix so that the eigenvalues of a related matrix are where you want them to be. We're going to do the same kind of thing. Um, okay, so here we go. Here we go. First step. You have to choose target poles for the estimator dynamics. Because we don't just want our estimator to be stable. We don't just want it to converge to the true states. We want it to do it quickly. 
in the way that we want it to be done. So we're actually going to make a controls problem for our estimator. If that makes any sense. So here are some design principles for estimators. Okay, so number one, the settling time for estimator should be somewhere like two times to six times faster than the settling time of the controller. And let me explain that. So what is our, our controller says this, the control input should be minus K times our best guess at what the states are. If our guess of the states is bad, then the controller is not gonna be doing what we hope it does based on our model. And uh, it's, it's not gonna work correctly. So as quickly as possible, we want to be feeding good state estimates to our controller. So that's why we say like the estimates should converge to the true states um, at least before the controller should have made the whole system settle. So like, let's, let's take a step back for our cart pendulum system. We made a system settling time of like one second. So we hope that the cart balances itself within one second. That means that our state estimation, we should converge to the true states much faster than one second. Because if our estimator takes five seconds to converge, then that means our controller has been using garbage and it should have already settled by now. So um, estimator has to be way faster than the controller because the controller depends on the estimator. Um, And actually, this is this is the only principle I'm going to give you. So let's let's get rid of the let's get rid of the plural here. I'm not a student of yours, so feel free to ignore the question. But are the stable positions of of, of uh, time it takes to converge? Um, they it's related. It's related to the time it takes to converge. The closer the eigenvalues are to the origin, the faster the estimator converges to the true states in discrete time. Okay, so let us, for the cart pendulum, is there any trade-off that is being made to make the estimator settle faster? Jim Molino, that's a very good question. So, um, the faster you make an estimator generally means it relies more on the sensor measurements. Okay, like in, think about an estimator as it's trying to use the model, your, your dynamics model, and it's also trying to use your sensors. I think a faster estimator believes the sensors more than it believes your model. And a slower estimator generally believes your model more than it believes your sensors. It's like, okay, you gave me a sensor measurement that doesn't agree with what I predict the state to be, but um, let me think about it. If you're, so if you're inter if those kinds of questions are interesting to you, you need to take optimal estimation with Crescidus because it gets deep into it and it's super it's super fascinating okay so for cart pendulum the settling time of controller is one second 
So let's choose our settling time of estimator um, to be a third of a second. So I'm kind of just the calm and filtering rabbit hole. Yes. And so I'm kind of picking this arbitrarily right now. And, and that's kind of the art of control and estimation. You, you might have rules of thumb, but in practice, you're going to play around with these settling times. We're just going to pick something for now. Okay. And um, let's choose an overshoot of 20%. So I'm, I'm picking dynamics. I'm picking dynamics for the estimator. And I kind of also arbitrarily chose 20% here. So the target, based on those conditions, target estimator polls, I'm going to call them beta star because I need another, another variable. I'll just call it beta. And I don't think we're using beta for anything else. This, this is also considering that the sampling frequency is 20 hertz. So, um, so if you combine settling time, overshoot, sampling frequency, you get these discrete roots for the estimator. So. Stay with me here. The characteristic equation that has these roots would be beta squared minus 0 0.42 beta plus 0 0.3042 equals 0. So this is the polynomial that has those roots beta star. Now, here's the connection. The eigenvalues of a minus lc so like that system matrix for the estimator dynamics should be equal to beta star and that means the characteristic equation of this matrix should be equal to that characteristic equation and this is where Cayley Hamilton theorem comes in. Let me remind you about good old Cayley Hamilton. Honest Cayley. Or wait, we need a we need a better nickname for him. Honest Abe is taken. Crazy Cayley. Okay, what it, what it says is a matrix satisfies its own characteristic equation. And so this means if I want this to be the characteristic equation of A minus LC, if I plug in A minus LC everywhere I see beta, then, um, wait, let's just do that. Then that will be the characteristic equation for this matrix. So what I'm doing, I'm taking that characteristic equation up here and everywhere I see a beta, I'm plugging in A minus LC. And this one, this 0 0.3 for whatever at the end, it's not multiplying anything. But because I made this into a matrix equation, now I have to put an identity matrix. So this is what Cayley Hamilton theorem means when it says a matrix satisfies its own characteristic equation. By plugging in A minus LC in this way, this will be the characteristic equation for that matrix. So 
goal solve for L in this equation? Which is a tricky equation to do because this is a nonlinear equation in the matrix L. You're going to have like some L multiplied with L. But that's why this is, uh, um, somebody came up with a beautiful solution, which I'm going to show you. This is going to take another five to 10 minutes. I know we're bumping it up against 130, but this will look familiar to you because we did this in a similar way for the control gain. Okay, so this is the estimator gain matrix that's the key to making our estimator work and we have to solve this equation for L. Okay, so let's multiply this out. We're gonna, we're gonna distribute. So I'm gonna have A squared minus ALC minus LCA plus LCLC minus 0.42a plus 0.42lc plus 0.3042i. So I just expanded everything out. And then I'm gonna organize the terms in a slightly different way. I'm gonna keep this a squared out in front I'm going to do minus 0.42a, which came from over here. And then I'm going to have this term that multiplies the identity matrix. And then I'm going to have some matrix times this matrix, which is a very special matrix. So we're going to have C over C times A, and this is going to be equal to that zero on the left hand side. So it turns out this matrix right here, to make it consistent with the line above, I'm gonna have to have minus 0 0.42 times L plus A minus LC times L. And then I kind of ran out of room here. Kate is right, it's called the observability matrix. So there's a comma here and then another L. So to help make sense of this, you're gonna have this term that multiplies with C, and then you're gonna have this term that multiplies with CA. And then you add that all up and you're gonna get back this equation up above. Okay, but because Kate mentioned it, Let's put a box around this and we won't be able to totally unpack this today, but this has a special name of the observability matrix and we can talk about why it's called that, but for now, just accept it. And I like to label this with like an O with a, like a curl on it capital O with like a curl for observability. Okay, remember our goal is to solve for L, which appears just right here. How do I extract that little beauty? First, we're gonna get this matrix by itself. Okay, so minus 0.42. L, so I'm, I'm rewriting that matrix, A minus L, C, L, L. If I get that by itself, it's going to be, so imagine that I brought all of this over to the right hand side of the equation first. Okay, but then I have this observability matrix that's multiplying this guy. So I have to multiply both sides by the inverse of this. So I'm gonna take this and imagine that I multiplied 
or not imagine, I'm going to multiply by the inverse. I won't just imagine doing it. So I have this, and it's going to be multiplied on the right by the inverse of that observability matrix. Now, for this example, this is going to be um, a 2 by 2 matrix, and L, so L is going to be a 2 by 1, so this is just like a column in the matrix, and this is just the, the left-hand column, L is the right-hand column. So and this two by two matrix is equal to the two by two matrix on this right hand side. So the way to interpret this is the L matrix is going to be the rightmost column of this matrix when you multiply it out. So the way to extract the rightmost column of this, so I'm gonna say, L by itself is going to be equal to this thing up above 2 by 2 times the inverse of the controllability matrix. And then if you multiply this by 0, 1, it'll pull the rightmost column out of it. And all you're going to be left with is L. Now, what I want to do is really quick. I want to pull this into MATLAB and prove to you that it does the job that we wanted it to do in the first place, meaning it moves our estimator poles to that ideal location. Okay, let's go, let's go to MATLAB really quick. Do I have my A matrix, B matrix, C, D? Okay, so let's do this. L, first I take A squared minus 0 0.42 times A plus 0 0.3042 times a two by two identity matrix. And then I multiply this by the inverse of this matrix, which was C on top of C times A. So that's the inverse of the observability matrix. And then I multiply that by zero on top of one. And this should return a two by one L matrix. Now, your boy really needs to go back and do a not so brief brush up on linear algebra. It comes back. It'll come back to you. Okay. If we take this matrix, A minus L times C, because now we have this L matrix, this should give us a two by two matrix. Um, and the eigenvalues of this, we want them to be equal to our target estimator poles and those were this 0 0.21 plus or minus 0 0.51 i so let's see if the eigenvalues are equal to that oh my goodness they are Um, wait, so we got, let's just put it down here just for some closure. L is this 1.654 20.1411. And so next time what we're going to do is we're going to run a simulation where we put this estimator to work and um, so we're gonna build some code in MATLAB 
to see how this would work. And we're also going to make an animation of the cart pendulum system within MATLAB. So this is going to move back and forth. It's going to move around. So I'll show you how to do that too. Oh yeah. We're going to do we're going to do some animation. So have your MATLAB ready to go next time cuz we're going to put this we're going to put this estimator to work. We're going to we're going to show how you simulate it. It's really it's really fun. So thank you for hanging with me. I know we went a little bit over time today. And, um, but man, estimators are, they're very interessante. And very practical because to do state feedback, you need estimates of the states and sensors aren't gonna give that to you. They can give you some information, but they don't give you the whole picture. Wait, did we not write anything for the last page? Oh yeah, there was, I think the last page is blank. Is that what you just said the next time? Oh, next time, we need an interesante emote wait what did you not write in Pico you're okay hey Quarun says thanks again Dr. E even though I'm not <laughs> I'm following a good half of it you still managed to keep it super interesting hey I'm really glad you enjoy it keep at it oh I see you wrote in the wrong chat that's okay um Hey guys, we just have this week, we have next week, and that's it for classes. I mean, we're drawing into the, the, the finishing stretch here, so you guys just hang in there. And um, we're going to make it through. So I could use this to try to build a one-wheel self-balancing board. You could add na 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 Quick homework question for part A, should we distribute gamma? Let me find that. You're talking about this. You're talking about gamma. You can build your own self-balancing board. You're gonna need a gyroscope. You're gonna need a big motor. If this summer project were to happen, we'll be working in person. Ooh, okay, so I know I feel so bad because a couple of you have emailed me about summer. I will get back to you. Now, it's going to be there. The way I'm, I don't have all the details yet, but I'm thinking in person is I, ideal because I want to build some stuff with hardware, but. There's, there should also be remote possibilities. But if you live near campus, we can make that work. Um, so Carl asked, should we distribute gamma? Yes. Uh, in which B1 would be gamma and B2 would be B times gamma. Oh, because you're talking about, because your goal is to put this in controllable canonical canonical state space form. So yeah, your goal, you got to dis, you got to distribute this gamma. So it's going to be gamma times z plus b times gamma on the top. Can we be part of the be part of the summer project as more of a learning project? Yes. The way I'm thinking of it is like I said, I don't have all the details, but the spirit of it is if you're somebody who's interested in doing control systems, I think the best way to learn it um, is number one, to do what we're doing, but uh, like the theory, but then get your hands on a project 
where you're actually trying to implement this. So the summer is kind of an opportunity to do that. My reason for doing it is for one, to build my own knowledge, but I want to make demos to use in future semesters of this class. And I even envision this class eventually being more hands-on where there's like a lab component and maybe you're building your own ro robot the whole time. Like project one, we had that motor project, right? I would like it if everybody had a motor and they're testing it and they're iterating on the controller. And so this summer, I want to, I want some assistance in building stuff like that, that I can leverage for future semesters. So you're going to be helping future generations of control engineers. And you'll also have the opportunity to do some of this stuff yourself. Is there some requirements to work with you, like prior knowledge other than this course knowledge? Um, I think it's just, I think it's just individual basis. Like, um, re like reach out to me. I know a bunch of you reached out to me. That's the right thing to do to just get the conversation going. Um, and I will get back to you. I've just been, uh, I've just, it's just. There's just been things that keep popping up. Squared Circle says, I'm interested in controls, but I'm not as knowledge on the subject. So the summer project would be a good way to get a hands-on experience. I agree. Um, Pika, I would say you, you, you definitely have the requisite knowledge to get going on this. I, I wouldn't have any concern there. No, you don't bother me at all, Pika. You don't bother me at all. Uh, Carl, office hours today. Let me see. Yes. Yeah. 4 p.m. I have office hours. Nuka says, I know MATLAB and a little Arduino. Would we be using other software that I should become familiar with? No, I think my plan is to use Arduino. Yeah, just MATLAB for simulation. Arduino to implement it on hardware. Okay guys, I need to go because I have to clean up Furnace 810. I have to dismantle the previous lab and make space for the workshop this week. Lego Logan says the fact that Kwanzaa is selling control stuff for students at multi-k prices is part of the problem. Control theory stands for students should be cheap and available to everyone. Hey, amen. Yeah, I've wrestled with that firsthand. I the, the Kwanzaa products are great. They are prohibitively expensive. If you want to give many students a hands-on experience. So the trade-off of building your own stuff is that you have to work with a lot of hardware issues that are kind of tangential to the actual controls itself. But that's still very good stuff to, work, to learn. Um, Nuka says, would MA Lab 1 be sufficient knowledge of Arduino? You're, that's a good starting point. And you'll have to learn more. But you can learn as you go. Would you recommend we put our class projects on a resume? I think it's, uh, I think Project 1 is a really good project to talk about with an employer because you can, um, yeah, like on your resume, you could say like designed a speed controller for a small DC motor. And they could be like, oh, like, what'd you do? And you'd be like, well, I had these constraints. 
Um, I had these performance criteria. I had some hardware constraints. I had sampling rate constraints. And then I went through this process. I picked some target poles, blah, blah, blah. And like telling that story, like if you really understand each step, I think that's that's a really good one to share with employers. Antonio, yeah, I look forward to see that. that that'll be really cool. Thank you, Pika. All right, everybody. It is always a delight. Arduino is supported by MATLAB, so maybe a kit with starter firmware and hardware for a project would be a nice thing for someone to make available. Yeah. All right, peace, Brandon. See you later, Mike. See you squared circle. Have a great day.